Welcome to the Probate Nation television show. We continue our discussion about how to probate an estate of a loved one. A Virginia probate is a process to transfer the title of or ownership of probate assets to the beneficiaries of a deceased person. Not all assets are probate assets, and there are different types of probate, some simple, others more complicated. Like a journey on a slow-moving steam engine train, probate in the state of an estate has a beginning, several stops along the way, and at the end of the trip, the balance of the probate assets remaining are delivered to the decedent's beneficiaries. Some probate train rides are short, while other probates seem to never end. The Probate Nation program today takes up the topic that is an early issue in the administration of almost every estate, and that is dealing with bank accounts, both in closing out the bank accounts of the decedent and opening up the necessary estate bank account from which you will operate the estate during probate. This program will address steps to take and pitfalls to avoid so you can keep the train moving on your probate journey. Joining us today is Jeffrey Lee, the Vice President and Relationship Manager of Cardinal Bank's Fairfax City office. He has over two decades of financial services experience and involvement with area businesses and families in the Northern Virginia community. During that time, he has helped many families and professionals handle estate and probate matters in the local bank branch. Also joining us today is Ryan McConnell, an estate and fiduciary specialist with, for Wells Fargo Wealth Bank, where he works on the administration of trusts and estates of bank clients. Prior to joining Wells Fargo, he was a partner in the law firm of Baxter, Baker, Seidel, Kahn, and Jones, PA, in Baltimore, Maryland, where he specialized in tax, trust, estate, and business succession planning. He received both his Juris Doctorate and Master's in Taxation from the University of Baltimore. Please welcome Jeff, Jeff Lee and Ryan McConnell. Fellas, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for you having know, us. Thank dealing you with bank accounts is, 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 in fact, a very challenging topic, not, notwithstanding how simple it might sound. And one of the very worst things coming out of the gate, I think, Ryan, is how is the bank account titled? Talk a little bit about how those things can surprise you when you show up at the bank thinking you're going to go ahead and close a bank account. Certainly. It's a, it's a great place to start because that's one of the first assets you're going to start working with. So when somebody walks into a bank, typically the account at the bank aside from it being a savings or checking account, is going to be titled. There's typically three ways that we have banks, bank accounts that are titled. First is if it's solely in an individual name. This is a bank account that doesn't have any other joint owners on it. It doesn't have any beneficiary designations on it. Mm -hmm. This would be your you know, single guy, single person, just one checking, one savings account. That's mm -hmm. an individual account. Sure. The second time account that you're going to see is a joint account. And this is most common when married couples or couples um, family later in life where it's two or more owners on the account. And what happens to these accounts is that immediately upon somebody's dying, the account will then pass to the surviving tenant or surviving owners of that account, so mm -hmm. all the assets included. Okay. Uh, the third type of account we're going to see is what's called POD or TOD, which stands for payable on death or transferable on death. Okay. And these are also known as beneficiary designations, whereby, say, I own the individual account singularly, but I have picked a beneficiary that will then be the owner of the account immediately upon my death. Okay, so that's something that, uh, that's one of the things that, now, can the titling of the account, um, uh, can this titling of TOD and POD prevent an executor from taking control of the asset? Absolutely. It's one of the reasons when people will title these accounts that way, because it will be outside of their probate administration, okay. where it will be outside the purview of the representative, the executor, where it automatically transfers to the beneficiary. It's what's mm -hmm. called by operation of law. Okay. It's, uh, it's a type of asset where your will doesn't dictate or direct where it will go, which a lot of people are surprised to find saying, my, my will leaves everything to you know, Jane, mm -hmm. and you have this account where you've, you left what's well, payable on death to John. And people are always shocked to find that out. I'm sure they are. Now, now Jeff and, and Ryan, I ask you both this. Can you normally tell if I'm at the house of a decedent and I'm the executor and I'm going through their bank statements and I see a bank account at Cardinal Bank or Wells Fargo, can I tell from the face of the account whether it's a POD or TOD? Would that normally be stated on the bank statement itself? How about it, Ryan? How about yourself? It, it can be. I've seen it both ways. Uh, some banks will have it on there directly lineated, and some banks won't have it on it. A lot of times you'll know the answer to that question when you actually walk into the bank 
And if you walk in there with you know, letters of administration or court order, and it says, no, we can't give this to you, you'll know then it's either been a jointly titled bank or it has a beneficiary designation on it. Okay. Now, in Cardinal, would we, would we see that on the bank statement at all? Typically, you would not you see would it not. on the statement. It would just be the name. If it was the jointly owner. held, you see two names. That way, you'd know it's jointly held. That is correct. Yes. Okay. Now, yeah, Jeff, we're, we're into coming into your, your bank branch, and we want to close a bank account. Um, what kind of documentation am I going to need to bring with me? Sure. Uh, if you come in, we would need a copy of the death certificate with the original seal um, and also the um, original letter of qualification from the courts uh, in order to uh, close the account. Now, when you say the, the death certificate, you write me we want an original death certificate because only the original have the seal on it. Is that what you mean? That is correct. Okay, so we so you, wouldn't, you wouldn't accept a copy? Typically, we would request or we would want the original uh, with the seal and on And the it. certificate There's of qualification from the courthouse, we'd want that with the seal with on it With the seal as well. as well. That okay. is correct. Okay. Now, so they need that. Do they need a photo ID to identify who they are as well? They would. They would need a Virginia driver's license or so, a photo identification. Something uh, like that. Okay. Yes, so generally, can, can, can they close that bank account with that one visit? Is it pretty they, easy to do? They could, yes, okay. with those three documents or the two documents and their identification. They could so when they that close account. that account, do they get a check or what happened at that point? We do. We would issue a cashier's check to the estate of okay. uh, the individual uh, that is deceased. Okay. Now, um, so, that, so that, that gets us to that particular point. Now, once they've, we, they've, they've closed the account, though, a lot of times they need access to the information that's actually in the account. In other words, they need bank statements and so on because they need to do the final tax return or something like that. Correct. How do they get access to that information? Um, they would request that information from myself or one of my staff members um, as far as statements or other legal documents pertaining to the bank account that they would need for filing of taxes. So generally, once the bank accounts close, you know, the, the, there's no online viewing of that. You're just going to have to request back statements directly from the banker. That's correct. The okay. online banking is shut down when the account is closed. Okay. Um, so if there, if we got that information now, what about Ryan's talk about safety deposit boxes? Okay. Mean, a lot of times, those things hold. People are very enamored with safety deposit box. They think they're the treasure trove of everything. Um, but getting access to them can be quite a little bit complicated as well. So how do people get access to that safety deposit box? They Typically, there'll be, there'll be two ways that will have require somebody that will get access into the box. Uh, now, remember, that's always going to be a bank representative present in the vault when it's going to be open. What we'll do first is if somebody's been given the letters by the court, mm -hmm. been given the authority to walk in there and say, I need to enter into this box, that's the easiest way. There's another way in Virginia where the law says that if they're just simply looking for a will, mm -hmm. that we'll also give them access to the box. If they sign an affidavit saying they, who, they, who they say they are, they do have the right to get into this box, and it's solely to search if, the, if there's a will in the safe deposit box. Because a lot of people will keep their valuable, valuable pieces and documents in the same location. Sure. Um, and then in that case, again, what we'll only do is we'll allow them to take the will. We'll remain a copy of it, but the contents will stay there. I understand. Now, what happens if somebody um, cannot find the key or they don't know the box number? You know, what, what are the banks normally able to do about that? First thing we're going to do is check the records. Um, we have a pretty good, or banks have a pretty good system in place that is locating either through a social security number, names, addresses to see did this person in fact have a safety deposit box. Okay. The next thing is to locate the box, and if there is no key, then we have a company, your banks will have a company that comes out and will drill into the box. And how about over uh, your experience, Jeff? Mm -hmm. How about what do you what do you see as far as getting into the safety deposit mm -hmm. box? See the same thing. We could go ahead and search under name or social security number to see if there's a box at any of our locations. Okay. And then if there was no key, um, we would contact our uh, locksmith company that we contract that out to to okay. enter the box. Good. Um, now, one of the things that a lot of people don't want to go through probate, and so there are procedures for what they call small estates. Um, a lot of folks have this, this view that they can just simply show up and say, I'm a small estate, I want the money out of the bank account A or bank account B, but there is a process to do that. So how is that handled at, at, at the bank, Jeff? You know, when you 
when someone shows up, do the, what do they have to have in order to be able to exercise the right of the small estate? Right. The they, they would need to present the evidence of small estate status uh, that is issued by the courts uh, with that document along with the appropriate identification, naming that person within that document. Um, they could go ahead and proceed to close the account. And there's a form that we have that we have them sign that it is a small estate account and they meet the criteria to do so. So, the, the, but the form that you're talking about that they bring from the court is, I think the preference is, is that you want to see the probate office actually issue a small estate affidavit. That is, is correct. Is that correct? That is correct. And that in hand with their identification, and then they'll fill out an additional affidavit for you folks. For the bank, It just yes. confirms everything so that, they're, that they actually qualify under the Virginia Code. That is correct. Now, um, so the only reason that someone would be rejected as far as being able to use that small estate affidavit because they lack those particular items. That is correct. Okay. Um, and um, any other problems that arise from the affidavits? Do you see people showing up with their own homegrown and prepared affidavits? Yeah. Or what other things arise that cause this to be? On occasion, we do. Uh, they will come in with a, a document that is not, you know, issued by the court, an appropriate document that would delay uh, them accessing the account and closing the account. Is that true for Wells Fargo as well? You have to have that that, that probate office issued affidavit for small state? We'll have that if we certainly always want something from the court um, for liability standpoint, sure. but there is the small state affidavit um, for smaller accounts to close out that they can print off online from the Virginia website. Okay, okay. Um, all right, so we've gotten through. We're going to close the bank account. We check the safety deposit box. The next thing that the, all the commissioners tell you is as soon as you come out of the gate after you've been qualified is you need to open up your own estate checking account. Okay, so Ryan, what do we need in order to do that? Again, you're going to need similar paperwork to closing the account. You're going to need the letters from the court. You're going to need your photo ID or passport license. You're going to need the original death certificate. And then you're going to need a, what we have people bring in is what's called a tax ID number mm -hmm. for the estate. And that's pretty comparable to what a social security number would be to the individual, sure. basically. It's alerting the IRS. We're opening up an account, and this is the state's name. Those are typically the documents that you're going to use. And then as the executor or the representative, essentially is your job to maintain that checking account or saving account um, and to pay the expenses of the estate. Sure. Now, when you open up that, uh, that checking account for the estate, um, do, you f do you normally recommend that folks... Um, get checks issued that they can then use to write and pay bills? Yes. I, I find that to be the easiest way for a, a representative to pay uh, expenses of the estate. Absolutely. Oh. Order the checks, write the checks to have a and paper the, trail. And the bank statements, do we have to do anything special to request that we get copies of the paid checks so that we can have those for the commission of accounts? Do we have to, have to request those or, or is that something that will happen automatically with the banks? With, with our institution, they will come with your monthly statement, uh, okay. a photocopy image done eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper for your okay. records. Wells Fargo is similar? It, it, it can be requested, but the certain both front and backs copies of written checks as well as deposited checks can show up on the statement. Good, good. Yeah, that commission is very fussy about that. They do want to see that. Um, so, Jeff, how about for estates now? We open up a checking account. Can I get online banking so I can do bill pay and pay stuff through bill pay? Absolutely. You, you can, can go ahead that? and go to our home page, and you would just register under the, the, the state account using okay. that federal ID number, and you can create a username and password and access online viewing and also set up bill pay. Uh, you may do that as well. And do you see a lot of folks do that for estates? Uh, I do not. Do not? Um, most of the customers, uh, they're writing checks and, and you know, doing it the old-fashioned way, per se. Okay. So. <laughs> the old-fashioned way. It's true. Um, so we can use bill pay. Okay, so, all right, so we have a checking account. I, if I'm closing out a checking account at, uh, at Wells Fargo or Cardinal Bank, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to be opening up a checking account there, then you probably wouldn't issue a check, per se. You would just go to debit the account out of one account into the new checking account I'm setting up. Would that be how that would be handled? We still issue the cashier's check, you and do. then it's deposited into the, the new 
system because it's going to the check will be issued to the representative of the estate and then they can then deposit that check into a, a checking account. Okay, at, at your institution. Correct. We close that and then cashier's check. Pay so when we do that, you know, one of the big things people are worried about, of course, fiduciaries don't want to find out that somehow, not that the Cardinal Bank of Wells Fargo is going to go, going to go bust, but um, that the bank, you know, closes down and then they have this FDIC insurance, but it's limited to. What's the current limit? Is it two fifty? Two hundred fifty thousand. Right, correct. Okay. So, uh, so you know, some of the things we've run into is how people want to know how can I make sure I got all my money covered if I begin to consolidate everything in one bank account mm -hmm. and I have a million dollars in, in that account, I'm only protected for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So, what is, what strategies do we have at the banks in order to deal with that? I, I know Cardinal Bank has some approaches. We do. We have uh, the program called CDARS. Um, basically, what that is, it's uh, uh, banks all across the country um, belong to the CDARS program. And you can come into my office and we can place that money within all the participating banks so that you have full coverage for 250000 per account. So it's like one stop shopping. So instead of having to go to five different banks to make sure you're fully covered, uh, you can just come into my office and open up five certificate of deposits or accounts in order to protect those assets under and FDIC insurance. That's good. And well, I mean, the bigger banks have a similar program. Of some same kind. thing. It's, it's a way of opening up separate accounts uh, at the same bank and still getting the FDIC insurance coverage. And I know that's very accounts. important. I know early on we used to go. You know, at one point we used to get to go to multiple banks and we'd have five right. or six or seven banks and we would max out and then the, and the coverage was lower than 250 at one point it was much less so it was very much a concern um, well you know the bank accounts it seems like it's a simple topic and yet we've touched on so many things where you could trip over yourself so let's just go ahead and and, and kind of go with you know some some final thoughts and recommendations advice that you guys have each from your own perspective as to what you know executors should be doing or not doing as they close accounts and open accounts so I'll start with with you Jeff Sure. Uh, the, the biggest thing is be prepared uh, and to understand that it's an ongoing process. Similarly, what we talked about right off the bat is that the accounts are usually the first asset a representative is going to deal with, whether it's opening them or closing the old ones. So right off the bat, you want to get off, you know, getting a good start. So we always recommend that a client call ahead of time. So they have a representative, somebody there in the bank, knowing that they're coming in and prepared. Plus, you can also tell them over the phone, hey, I need you to bring in the certificate, the original. I need you to bring in the paperwork from the court. I need mm -hmm. you to bring in your identification so that they know that they have it all collected. Staying organized and keeping good accounting from day one is the most integral part of the probate process, in my opinion, I'm sure from the bank's opinion as well. Um, and so really that's what I would tell a representative is, is to understand the process, to understand that this may be the first time you're dealing with an estate, but it's not the first time that we're dealing with it. So we've, we've done this before. Um, and, and there are hurdles, but you have to do it one at a time. And so what we tell people is not to get frustrated with the process, to know that we're here for you, to know that we're going to take care of this and that we know kind of how to get from point A to point B. Um, and do, again, you know, just, just not to get frustrated or fed up and ask for help. Good. So I think the big thing is when you get ready to go into the bank, I think what I take away from that is to call ahead and uh, let's mm -hmm. review with the person who you need to bring so they understand your situation so you don't get frustrated and come in the front door and realize I should have had that one piece of paper I left on the counter that I need and I got to come back. Okay, so that's a good, that's a good suggestion. The communication is very, very helpful. Jeff, how about some final thoughts from yourself? You know, it's, it's similar. I mean, to be prepared with the correct documents, you know, it's a very stressful time when you lose the loved one and you're in this type of position. Sure. Um, and I've had, you know, clients um, that have come from out of state and they think they can just take care of it all in one sitting or within that weekend or, you know, during the funeral uh, or the memorial service. Mm -hmm and come to find out that, again, they don't have the appropriate paperwork to, to take care of the, you know, bank accounts. Um, so, yes, calling ahead, being educated, you know, what documents you need uh, is very helpful. And also recently I ran into a situation of co-executors. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of banks do not open accounts where there's co-executors because it requires both parties to sign each mm. and every check. Interesting. Um, and that just recently came across the... A situation recently that uh, an estate account that we're dealing with. So, um, you know, it's again, you know, check with your banks on your policy, especially if there's a co-executor, you know, uh, clause that is in the document uh, to make sure that your bank can 
and uh, facilitate that account. And in that instance, though, if the, if the will of the trust, if the will said mm -hmm. that each executor can act unilaterally and out without the consent of the other, would that be okay? That would be okay. But if it's an and mm -hmm. situation, then um, again, you need to check. You know, each bank is is going to differ. But uh, so that's an important drafting thing from the outset. We need to make sure we get to our time absolutely. Too. If you can create that, that can be a real administrative nightmare from the fiduciary side, having to get two signatures. Correct. Uh, although it may be um, intended. Um, well, fellas, listen. I want to I want to thank you know Jeff Lee from Cardinal Bank and 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 Ryan McConnell from Wells Fargo Bank. You guys, thanks so much for coming in today and taking the time to talk to us, share your thoughts. I mean, and 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 thank you for your commitment and the commitment of Cardinal Bank and Wells Fargo to educating the public on these types of topics. It's greatly appreciated. Sure, sure thing. Thanks. For thank us. you very much, Richard. You're very welcome. You know, uh, without a doubt, you know, probate can be complicated and confusing as you navigate your way from the local probate office after being properly qualified and begin the process of identifying and marshalling the assets of the decedent. You know, one of the very first assets you typically must deal with is the closing of the decedent's bank accounts and gaining access often to the decedent's safe deposit box. And at the same time, a critically important to-do item for the personal representative is to open an estate checking account to hold all estate probate funds, including the funds of the bank account you may have just closed at that same bank. I come away from the discussion knowing that the following information is needed to open and or close a bank account if you're probating an estate as a personal representative. You need an original certificate of qualification with seal on it from the probate office. This is something you're going to receive when you first get qualified. Make sure you have one with a seal on it. Second thing you're going to need is a federal employer identification number. This is something that we used to have to obtain, you know, by mailing in or faxing in, but nowadays you can obtain that online. And you want to make sure you take the time to go ahead and get that before you show up. That's the only way you can open a bank account for the estate. It must have a federal employer identification number. And lastly, you're going to need a personal photo identification for yourself so we can understand that whoever's presenting themselves at the bank is, in fact, the person who is qualified to, to take these steps at the bank to either open or close a bank account. But with this information in hand, you should be able to keep your probate train moving. And this brings us to the conclusion of our show today. On behalf of myself and the Probate Nation, thank you for visiting with us.